The GH5 was and is an incredible camera. This thing is a little over three years old and it still holds up to this day. I wanted to talk about how I shoot with the GH5, why I still think it has value in today's camera world, why it might not be perfect for every situation and why you might want to use something else, but just give you kind of a rundown of how I use the GH5 and where I think it fits for certain types of projects. Because this is a pretty popular camera. Many people know about the GH5, they've used it, but it also gets maybe a bad reputation in, in some circles of not being full frame or being kind of outdated and old now. And so I just wanted to kind of shed a little light on this camera because I love so much about it. I still use it. In fact, I posted over on Instagram uh, a picture from today. I was doing a shoot with the GH5. This was a a pretty easy, pretty simple shoot, um, but that's why I think the GH5 makes so much sense for a lot of people, and maybe it might work for you if you haven't considered it, or maybe there's some lessons you can learn from all of this that might be relevant to whatever camera it is that you do use. So just use the GH5 today. I know it's old, it's outdated, everyone's talking about the R5 and the A7S 3 and all the cool new stuff that's coming out, Blackmagic Pocket Cinema 4K and the 6K or the Ursa Mini, but the GH5 still holds a special place in my heart and I still love to shoot with it because it is a pretty incredible camera. When you think about what this offered, you know, over three years ago when it first came out, the fact that a lot of these things are still not all that common and even in a lot of cases are just now finally becoming more mainstream, becoming more ubiquitous on the other cameras like from Sony, from Canon, etc. Let's start with one of my favorite features, and this is a small one, of course, but just getting the flip screen right. Granted, Canon has been doing that, but it's taken Sony how long to implement a, just a basic flip screen like this so you can do selfies, so you can tilt it any which direction you want. There's so much to love about a flip screen like this. And even Panasonic themselves on the S1, you know, they made the S1H with the valuable flip screen and they charge more for it. The GH5 was the GH5, and I should mention the GH5S in all of this. I'll talk a little bit why I think I personally prefer the GH5, but the S probably is better in certain situations. However, let's for you know the example, let's just pretend they're kind of the same camera for the most part, although there are some, some minor differences. But yeah, the screen is fantastic. Also, the batteries on the GH5, this is all the small stuff. I'm getting to like some of the better stuff, but the, the batteries on the GH5, they last as long as you want would want batteries to last, even shooting in the 4K modes you know, get a good set of batteries. The batteries are cheap. They're not really expensive. Like, you know, what I have to use for the Ursa Mini where I have to get the Anton Bauer gold mount batteries. They're incredibly expensive and last about the same time. Granted, it's a much bigger camera and has different things that you would want to use it for, but the GH5 batteries, phenomenal. Let's talk about 10-bit 422 all I. Yes, it's got it. Three and a half years ago, Panasonic delivered. Granted, it's Micro Four Third, it's not full frame, but that's why with my setup, I have the Speed Booster. Of course you have the Speed Booster. If you have the GH5, you probably have the Speed Booster because everyone knows how great a Speed Booster is being a focal reducer, giving you that wider field of view so you get closer to Super 35 with the GH5 rather than having that 2X crop, you're only dealing with like a 1.5X crop. It's probably some factor or slightly different than exactly 1.5, but it's around there. And of course, pairing it with the Sigma 18 to 35. What a fantastic lens just built for almost, it feels like it's made for this camera with the speed booster. This is like how I have the GH5 almost all the time because it's so versatile. If you have the 18 to 35 with the speed booster, you can get wide and medium shots and you can go all the way to a 1.2 essentially with the speed booster on here. All electronically controlled from EF to micro four third. So no problems there. And then I typically almost always have some kind of variable ND on the front if I'm doing a run and gun situation. Today, as you saw in the photo, I'm outside, so I need NDs to keep my shutter angle, which is another thing that GH5 has that even the A7S III still won't implement, shutter angle. What a simple feature to have in, in the software, in the firmware of your camera, shutter angle. GH5 had it, GH4 had it way before then. Wonderful, helpful feature. Keep it at 180 degrees pretty much all the time but you need you know, an ND of some kind. Now there isn't any built-in ND, would that make this camera better? Of course, but there are adapters that have ND filters in it and many times you can get away with a variable ND on the front if it is a run and gun situation. Let's talk about run and gun and why the GH5 is so awesome in that setup. 
This thing is so lightweight. I just compared it to the S1H from Panasonic, much bigger, much heavier. And even for a hybrid to handhold the S1H all day long, like you can do with the GH5, it's it, it's almost like double, triple what feels like the weight in terms of ex exhaustion and, and wearing you down. The GH5, even with this, you know, the 18 to 35 Sigma is a decently heavy lens. It's not the biggest, of course, but it's it's decent. You don't get tired running around with this thing. Oh, did I mention the internal stabilization? Yes, many other cameras have internal stabilization nowadays, but the GH5 internal stabilization is really, really good, and you can use it with the 18 to 35, no problem. And you can run and gun all day long, run around, hold the camera, even if you get a little, a little bit shaky at the end of the day because you're a little bit tired, it's really not a problem because you have internal stabilization, which the GH5S does not have. They removed that for the GH5S, which is why I would say in some situations, it may be the better or worse choice depending on what your needs are. If you really, really need the low light, the GH5S probably has you covered there. But with the 18 to 35 I'm, and the speed booster, I'm really not ever struggling to have enough light. I mean, if you wanna shoot in the pitch black, sure. But just this morning, I was up at 5 a.m. before the sunrise filming right at that beautiful early morning dawn, totally fine. Granted, I'm shooting at a 1.2, but I was able to do it and I wasn't struggling with the GH5. Now, is the footage as pretty as something from the Ursa Mini? No, it's not. But a lot of times you don't need that extra horsepower. You know, there's a lot of projects that are more run and gun, maybe they're just going to YouTube. They're small, cheaper, more efficient type videos that aren't, you know, full-blown feature films or short films or documentaries or music videos or commercials. And it's just video content for, you know, YouTube or, or the web or like a homepage. The GH5 shines in these environments because you can film pretty much anything, anywhere, anytime, and you can get away with it and have really good video quality. There are many times where you might want to upgrade the GH5 with a, a rig, some kind of kit, kind of make it look all cool with a, a map box and rails and extra screens and you know shoulder rig. You can do all that. Do you need to? No, you don't need to. Like with the Blackmagic Pocket cinema cameras, it's almost always recommended that you're gonna to have to have some kind of battery attachment because the batteries don't last all that long. You probably want some kind of screen because the screen itself doesn't flip. It's beautiful imagery. It's really great value for the price, but there's some inefficiencies with the camera as is. The great thing about the GH5 is everything is built in. The only thing you need to do is put a lens on it and a battery and a memory card and you're ready to go. You don't need anything else. Even if you're in a situation where you're outdoors and the screen you can't see, you have the viewfinder to look through and you can you know, hold it up to your face and kind of block some of the light that way. Is it the best viewfinder? No, the Sony ones are better, but does it work for most situations? Absolutely. And the price point, I mean, nowadays you can get the GH5, I think for like a thousand dollars. You know, you can, it's 1300 bucks new, but you can probably find it used, you can find it refurbished, whatever you're looking for, it's a really, really affordable camera and still does all these great features that are just now coming to the forefront with things like the A7S III. Of course, that's full frame. Of course, it has 4K 120, probably better dynamic range. Who knows? We'll see. But, oh, and the autofocus, I should say. The autofocus, yes, yes, the autofocus is not that great on the GH5, but frankly, many times I'm not even using the autofocus. And if I do need it for like videos, let's like uh, for photos, let's say, and I want to use the 18 to 35, well, the tap, you know, the tap to zoom in functionality on the touchscreen allows you to manual focus basically even better than autofocus might get certain times. You know, how sometimes autofocus, you'll focus on what you want, but it doesn't quite get it. It's a little off. You can manual focus right on the screen in real time, and it's a slightly slower than autofocus, but not by much once you get used to it. And then you're in a situation where you know exactly what you want in focus is in focus because you punch in, you zoom, you make sure it's there yourself. And you can do the same thing recording video. Now you can't punch in while you're recording video. I wish that were a feature. That's nice on the Ursa Mini that you can do that. You can double tap on the screen and check your focus while you're recording, but you can't do that in GH5, one minor little gripe. But overall for a thousand dollars, let's say, maybe a little bit more for the lens and the speed booster, right? But these are things that can last you for other camera systems too as well. Like, a speed booster will probably hopefully work on an inevitable GH6. I mean, this speed booster is from the GH4 days, so that was an easy, you know, like addition. It didn't really cost me anything because I already had it. Same thing with 18 to 35. The things outside of the camera will last you a lot longer, typically. 
And I have a fun little pistol grip on here. That's a new addition. You don't need that, but I kind of like just being able to hold with two hands. Just another kind of anchor point. So if you are running gunning and you need to move trade hands real quick, it's a tiny little thing. I mean, it's like 10 bucks. They're really cheap. It's basically nothing. And you don't have to do it if you don't want to. It's a recent addition I've made. And like I said, you can rig it out if you want to, if you want to look professional. Like if you want to look like the GH5 is maybe more in the league of an Ursa Mini or a Red or an Alexa, of course you can rig it out. But how many times do you not want to set up all that extra junk just for recording maybe a YouTube video, a vlog, something that you don't need, there's no client there, so there's no one to impress. It's just you creating content. That's where I think the GH5 shines. And in fact, where hybrid shine, a lot of people wanna talk about these cameras like they're photography cameras only. And if you want a, a real video camera, then you gotta go buy something really expensive that's you know got all those features that you want. Like, oh, no recording limits? Well, the GH5 has no recording limits. Does that make it a real video camera? Shutter angle, is it a real video camera because it's a shutter angle? 10 bit 422, you know, for a while it was like, oh, if you want that, buy a real video camera. GH5 has had that. You don't need any kind of external recorder to do it. If you want to do high frame rate, you of course you have 4K60, which is pretty slow for the most part. You know, it's definitely going to stabilize your footage a little bit. It's not super slow mo like you can get with a Phantom. And if you need 120, you can drop down to 1080 if you need to. Granted, it's not the best, but we're just now getting 4K 120 in the full frame cameras, and that's becoming a little bit more of a mainstream thing. Meanwhile, 1080, 120 has been working, you know, for the past three or four years or, or so. And 4K 60 in a body like this size and, and style, and granted that mode is 8-bit, so it's not the best, but there's no extra crop or anything, and stabilization still works. You can do almost any type of shoot with the GH5, and that's why I think it's so fantastic, is because you can upgrade it if you want to, but you don't have to. A lot of these cameras, you know, they're talking about the R5 now, and it overheats, oh, but just get a Ninja 5 and take the cards out, and it won't overheat on you. You can record 4K 30 HQ mode. Well, okay, but then you have to have this external monitor every single shoot you want to do that. Same thing with the Sony cameras for the longest time. Oh, they're 8-bit eight, you know, eight internal, but you can do 10-bit, you can do 4K, you can do some of these things externally, and you have to have the monitor every single time you want to do that. The beauty, I think, of the GH5 is that it is the true hybrid in the sense that everything you want is built in. There is no extra stuff that you need to add to get the features you want, aside from uh, you know, 10-bit, uh, 60 frames a second, if you do want that externally. But you can still do 4K 60 internally, albeit only in 8-bit mode. So there are a few minor, minor setbacks, but I honestly haven't been in any situation where the GH5 hasn't been kind of up to speed. Granted, things will look better, right? If you compare it to a Red or an Alexa or even the Ursa Mini Pro, it's gonna kind of pale in comparison in terms of the ultimate image quality if that's your goal. If your goal is absolute image quality, then you know all the expensive ways to make that happen, even the kind of more affordable ways to make that happen. But if you want efficiency and simplicity and just ease of use and flexibility, that's where I think the GH5 shines. Even this you know, microphone that I have on top of here, just to capture just ambient sound. I'd recommend when you get these, don't get the ones with the batteries built in. They maybe sound a little bit better, but you're probably not even relying on that audio all that much anyway. It's probably just for reference or like a, oh, my main recording like got deleted or corrupted and I thankfully I have a backup. This doesn't have any internal batteries, so I never have to bring extra batteries or worry about the microphone dying on me as you do with some of the other kind of shotgun top-mounted systems or you have to have you know some extra power system hooked up to it. Just plug it right in, and it's just a microphone, and it works, and it sounds great, and even these are really, really cheap as well. So there's not enough I can, I, you know, I can't, I can't say enough about the GH5 because it is so incredible for what it does and what it is and what it's supposed to be and it's three and a half years old this is like it was a no-brainer at the time for me and i've used it for so many shoots and you know for photography you got 20 megapixels you've got all the same stabilization features you got autofocus that works much better in photography mode than it does in in video mode just some simple things uh, a variable nd for if you're outside running gun a microphone, maybe a pistol grip if you want it, but don't even need it. I mean, there's times where people put these things on, you know, Ronins and gimbals and all sorts of stabilization that many times you might not even need, depending on the shot. Now, if you're doing full-on movement and tracking and all that stuff, yeah, it's going to be smoother and it's going to be better. 
But with the internal stabilization, there's a lot of handheld stuff that you can get that's perfectly smooth that would be a challenge or a chore on other cameras. Even the Ursa Mini Pro or the Pocket Cinema cameras for that matter, there's no internal stabilization. You might have lens stabilization, but that's not nearly as good as some like dual. If you don't have the Sigma 18-35 and you do some native lens that has stabilization as well, like you're, you, you're golden in most situations and you can do you know, kind of faux slider shots and jib shots and follow shots that look like a gimbal, especially with additional stabilization that you can add in post-production if you really, 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 really need it. There's so much you can do with a camera that's $1,000. And so when I complain about, or I nitpick things about the Canon R5 and how it's not, you know, up the speed and people say, it's just for photography. You know, it's like, you're spending $4,000. It should be able to do at least some of these features. And granted, I know it's way more megapixels and it's full frame and all the excuses, I get it. But I think there's a beauty to the simplicity of what Panasonic did with the Lumix GH5 in just giving you all the features right in the camera. And I still think to this day, you know, with the vlog upgrade, recording 10 bit, if that's what you want for maximum dynamic range, it still has value compared to other cameras. Will it be outdated? I'm sure it will eventually, probably by a GH6 or something similar. I mean, even the S1H is kind of like a bigger version of the GH5 in a lot of ways. It's taking that video hybrid mindset and just maximizing it on their full frame camera. But in terms of frame rates, you know, the S1H isn't doing 4K 120. It's giving you a little bit better 4K 60 at 10 bit. It's giving you 6K, which is a significant upgrade from 4K, but it's not blowing the GH5 out of the water because it's a, it's a bigger sensor size, twice as big, in fact, but you can kind of get there with the speed booster again on the GH5. There's so much that like, this camera is not limited. If anything, it's one of the few cameras that feels unlimited in its potential and its capability. Again, I'm not saying it's the best camera ever invented. If you have something that's really high production value, really premium, and you have a crew, and you've got you know an AC, and you've got all this stuff around you, like beautiful cinema lenses and all this stuff, yes, go all out, spend the money. But don't forget how sometimes some shoots, you don't need all that. You can get by with so much less, and it actually is all kind of right here for a little over a thousand dollars in 2020. So if you didn't buy it when it first came out, I'm not saying you should buy it now, maybe probably wait for the GH6. But if you're in a situation where you're like, well, I just wish shooting videos was more easy, more fun, more intuitive. Cause I'll tell you what, there are some mini, I'm not taking that out for fun. It's not a fun camera to carry with you on vacation or just to take out to a farmer's market on the weekend. It's a chore, it's a burden because it needs so much stuff. The batteries are bigger and heavier. The lenses, if you're doing the Cineprimes, are super, super heavy. You got to do the shoulder rig and your, you, the cards are more expensive. If you're doing CFast, granted, it does do SD as well. And there are more features with the Ursa, Ursa Mini Pro. The built-in ND is very, very helpful, but it's like a cinema camera for cinema purposes, which makes sense on certain shoots when you need that higher production value, you got bigger budgets. But there's many, many times where, you know, the bare minimum of a GH5 is more than adequate. So don't ever forget as much as we talk about new cameras and how great stuff is, even if a GH4 um, still has value in a lot of ways, I probably would definitely pick the GH5 over the GH4, but I mean, that camera's what, over six years old now? So there's so much stuff that even though it's not the latest and greatest, still has so much value. And it, I don't wanna sell it short in, in the fact that we're just three and a half, four years away from when this thing first came out and we're finally kind of catching up with more like the mainstream cameras. And it makes me honestly excited for the GH6 and what the potential is there. I am I just shot with the S1H and it's a beautiful camera, full frame. It's fantastic, the dynam dynamic range and just beautiful, beautiful imagery. But the GH5 isn't that far behind it. When you consider how affordable it is and how old it is, in today's day and age, if you feel bad about owning a GH5 or a GH5S, don't. They're incredible cameras that can do incredible things and still have so much value. And one of the things I turn to in my kit because 
there's really nothing else at this point that just does so much right out of the box and you can just run and gun and get so much great content so quickly and efficiently. And like I said, it's fun. It makes filming content so easy and simple that you forget about all the technicals and, oh, did I bring the right you know adapters and cables to hook up these external monitors? And oh my goodness, I forgot my rails. So now I can't do my map box and my follow focus. And oh no, this ring doesn't fit my lens. And what am I going to do? All of that stuff is is the nice premium trappings that you kind of can throw on things and make them nicer, a little bit more easy to use in certain situations to frankly make your camera look cooler uh, for Instagram or for a client. Like that's all fair. I, I do it myself too. If I need to impress somebody or just feel like kind of, you know, have the need for it on a particular shoot. But there are many times where you don't, and you can have a lot of fun with a camera like the GH5. Maybe it's not the GH5. Maybe it's a different one. Maybe it's a Fuji or an Olympus or a Sony, for that matter. There's so much power with these. this style of shooting. It kind of unlocks the ability, from my perspective, to film basically nonstop all day, never getting tired, and having perfect stabilization almost always. You can run around, follow, get whatever you want, recording nonstop it unlocks a lot of opportunities that just weren't a thing five, 10 years ago in terms of filmmaking potential and creativity of what you're able to achieve. I mean, if you think, you know, the one take shot in movies is really cool and really impressive, well, yeah, because it, it is when it's, you know, those big budgets and stuff, but you can basically do one take all day on the GH5. I mean, dual card slots. So you can just hot swap as you go if you need to. You could record continuously all day on this, just switching cards. Granted, you probably would run out of battery at a, at a certain point, but of course you could always hook up some external battery if you really needed. So there's so much that this camera offers, as well as many cameras in this class. I think that's why I get maybe a little disappointed by the people who just write off hybrids as like, well, that's mainly for photography. Just go get a video camera. It's like, don't you see the power and the potential of something like this? How much it can do if it has the flip screen, if it has all these features that were standardized by Panasonic three and a half years ago, just makes you think and appreciate the great tools we have at our disposal to do new creative things pretty much every single day. I really love the GH5. It's incredible. So fun. So fun to use. Checking out the chat, I've had the GH5, got destroyed, bought a Fuji X-T3 as a replacement and had to buy back a GH5 only for the fluidity of movement. X-T3 stutters with panning, uh-oh. I would look for the A7S III and autofocus. Yes, autofocus, we know, we know. It will be better on the A7S III, I'm sure. And the 4K120, fantastic. But I look at the A7S III as finally just like Sony listening and doing all the things they should have been doing all along. And I'm excited for what? potential that unlocks for a potential GH6. And then at that point, you know, comparing those two, because that's kind of what it's always been, for me at least, the GH line versus the A7S line, you know, the A7S, the original, the A7S II, and now the A7S III versus like, you know, GH3 or 4, GH5, and then now GH6. Very different cameras, but I've always appreciated the like love and attention to just making it so intuitive and so easy to use on the GH5 compared to the A7S series, which I've always had there kind of limitations, but looks like they fixed a lot of that with the 7S III. Micro Four Thirds, still worth it. For size and convenience and simplicity, absolutely. If you're in it, like the S1H from, you know, basically the same thing, just full frame, but so much bigger, so much heavier and noticeably so, not just like, a, oh, it's just a little bit heavier, you'll get used to it. Like my time was shooting with it and then going back to the GH5, I'm like, oh, thank goodness this is so lightweight. I'm sure you would get used to it on the G, uh, on the S1H eventually, but that's just a joy to have the, the smaller lenses in certain situations. Again, this isn't across the board every single time, every shoot, oh, I always shoot with the GH5. No, that would be silly because there's certainly times where it's not the right tool because image quality is what's most important on that particular shoot. But there's many times where image quality is almost secondary to the convenience of just capturing the footage at hand. And that's where I think cameras that are like hybrid style are just so flexible and so functional. Autofocus is essential on a gimbal and moving subjects, which is what I film. And autofocus is the reason I'll switch to another system. GH6, if it exists, is not certain to have good autofocus. Mm, probably. We'll, we'll look into that. And yeah, if you're using gimbal and you need autofocus, totally get it. That is not something I would recommend for the GH5. Uh, in fact, I would 
definitely opt for something that is autofocus or, you know, I mean, you have to get a focus puller if you, you know, really want to go all out, but uh, probably outside of the budget for a lot of people who are in those situations. So I totally understand the autofocus thing. If you need it, that's not how I shoot a lot of the stuff I do. So it's, it just doesn't apply to me as, as much, but I do appreciate it for the Sony cameras that offer it. GH5 has plenty of usability for video, except the reliable autofocus. Of course, definitely. For all my film narrative work, I shoot with a 40 year old vintage Canon FD still lens. What's autofocus? Yeah, I mean, there's many lenses where autofocus, if you wanna use a particular lens, is autofocus isn't, isn't gonna be an option, even on the Sony cameras and the Canon cameras. There might be a particular lens you wanna use. I don't know why it would be. It's gonna depend shoot to shoot, but maybe it's just not autofocus. I mean, if you have, the cinema lenses, like these, this is the Zine, uh, that's the 50 on the Ursa Mini Pro there, and there's no autofocus there. So it's, it's, a, it's a trade-off thing that I get it for the people who need it, they're gonna go a certain route, but if you don't need it, it's not that like essential thing of like, when I look at the R5 and the overheating in the R6, which we will talk about later, the overheating is so crippling for that camera, whether it's intentional or not, it could be, you know, maybe it's just total accident that Canon messed it up. It's just so detrimental. Like every single feature is you basically have to like take it off the, the table because the camera overheats and gets rid of all those features that are actually good and decent. And yeah, maybe there's autofocus, but if it's only in the 4K 30 line skip mode, you know, like I can't do 4K 120. I can't do this, you know, 8K raw that I bought the camera for, I spent all this money for, then then what good is it if I can't do do the things that I, I wanna do with it? And same thing with the A7S II, like let's say, which is the upgrade from the A7S, the original. A7S III, much, much better now. But there's so many limitations with the A7S II from my perspective, the screen, the battery, uh, the codec, uh, some of the high frame rate option type stuff. It's just, there was so much there where like, for some people, I get they don't necessarily care about those things or they'll do the workarounds, but I like the fact with the GH5 that I don't have to fuss with it. There's nothing on here where I'm like, oh yeah, but like, you know, I, I have to have the, the external battery pack charged up like you do with like the pocket, you know, let's say, or with the Sony, you're like, oh, I have to have my external monitor. Otherwise I can't see what I'm doing. And it's like, I've, I've never had that issue. And I've put the GH5 in some, you know, strange, weird corners and ovens and all sorts of places. And it's like, I've always been able to see the screen and, and shoot what I needed to shoot because it's so versatile and there aren't any of those annoying limitations with it where it's like, oh, that's kind of annoying and inconvenient. I have to do some kind of external third-party solution. It's like, no, everything's right in there. There's not really much else you need to add in order to make it functional. Let's see. Uh, autofocus isn't a big issue, but a bit behind compared to the others, but still fun camera for sure. Absolutely. Love my GH5 and hundred percent agree. It's super fun to create content with. It just feels natural and so much flexibility and usability. Absolutely. Tell me about the ND filter you're using. This is the SLR magic, uh, ND two. So I get the 82 millimeter mount cause so I'm, I'm, uh, using a step up ring for the Sigma 1835, which is a 72 millimeter uh, filter thread, not 77, which is you know one of the most common, but that's why I get the 82 uh, filters. Typically I get as big as I can find. That way I never get a lens that's like bigger than the filter and I can always just step up to it. Um, I tend to, it just seems to work a little bit better that way. And that way you're not worrying about any like corner issues and you're kind of shooting through the middle of the, uh, of the filter. It's just a nice way to do it. And it's the SLR Magic Variable ND and it has the hard stops, it even has numbers on here so you kind of know where you're at so like it has you know markings one through ten so you can kind of set your your stops there and i just have a lot of luck with this uh variable nd it's not the most expensive one it's not the cheapest one it's kind of i think in the middle uh they might even have like a, a mark three version or something at this point i don't even know if i've had it for quite a while but it just works really well i don't have any of the weird weird issues you, you get with some of the older variable nds i think a lot of that has kind of been sort of fixed um, from kind of the first generation variable NDs when that first uh, became a thing. But yeah, I, I really like it. It works well. And it's something that can pretty much always kind of stay on the camera because it almost always comes in handy. Now they have lights, you know, that are like the 300D Mark II. They're like super, super bright. The Godox lights, super bright. If you're outside, it's going to be super bright. And if you want that super shallow depth of field, which you might want in certain situations, you want to shoot it like a 1.2 or a 1.4, 
or even like an F2. F2 is really shallow if you're doing the, the speed booster and you kind of get that, you know, Super 35 field of view. So I'd say definitely if you're not using ND filters, you should. Variables are worse than, you know, standard static ND filters. Those are almost always going to be the cleanest, but for run and gun where you just need to kind of fade your exposure depending on what you're filming on the go. Super smooth way to do it, especially if you know you kind of always want to shoot it like a 2.8, let's say, which is still very shallow on the GH5. If you want to shoot f4, that's maybe a little bit more comfortable for keeping things in focus. But on the wider end at like 18, it's not super cinematic at f4. Maybe like a 2.8 is a little bit better if you want that shallow depth of field bokeh effect. F2 definitely, but harder to pull focus. But I just like that you can variable, just like smoothly change your exposure without fiddling with your aperture that's gonna click or you know adjusting your shutter or your ISO on the fly. You can just do it right on the, the variable depending on the situation. And almost always you're gonna have enough light. So it depends, but in general, this is like basically all you need to just run and gun all day switch cards, switch batteries. If you put a microphone on whoever your uh, your subject is, it's gonna be a little bit better. Uh, audio quality, this is just kind of for reference, but you know, also like this works pretty well as like a vlog camera too, with this microphone on it. I've used it for some of my old videos um, and it sounds okay. It's not the best, but it does the job. Let's see, tell me about the ND. Okay, we did that one. This is the perfect time for Panasonic to release a GH6 with a new autofocus system to satisfy those that work that way. Absolutely. And then thanks uh, for that ND filter explanation. I've got that same setup, GH5 reigns. My Tiffin is not quite strong enough for the Arizona daylight footage. Yeah, the um, the SLR Magic uh, ND, it's like a ND.4 to 1.8. Uh, it seems to do the trick almost all the time. I'll shoot, you know, low ISO 200 outside, maybe like an f 2.8, and then I'll be I'll be kind of maxing out the ND around that that zone at like the nine or ten or kind of max, which is not ideal of where you want to be. But you, if you're in the shade, it's going to be much much less. Usually with the variable ND, you don't want to be maximum. This one does stop you from going too much where you get like the X polarization effect. Uh, but yeah, try and shoot you know variable NDs like minimally if you can. You don't want to just be doing it all the time because it will muddy up your footage in certain situations. But a lot of it is also very subtle, so most people aren't going to notice. The R6 is not enough for me to move away from the GH5. We're going to talk about the R6 and why I think it is the real tragedy of the whole situation. The R6, the poor R6. Before we talk about that, I want to talk about some rumors. Actually, not even rumors. Let's dive right into it. This is the Lumix S5. Specs have been leaked. This is Panasonic's next full-frame mirrorless camera in the S series. So there's the S1, the S1R, the S1H, and now we have the S5. There are a lot of specs to go through. We're not going to go through all of them. If you want to see this, it's over on lrumors.com, lrumors for L mount. Hopefully that makes sense. It's not the greatest name for a mount, the L mount. I don't know. It just, Canon already had L, L series lenses. So I get that it's the Leica mount, but I don't know. They should have come up with a better name, I think. Anyway, the S5, let's talk about it, because this is kind of the littler version of the S1, supposedly, and I'll get right to it. There's nothing in terms of video that's all that stunning or staggering about the S5. It's not doing 4K 120. In fact, it's not even doing any kind of new autofocus system. It's in here somewhere, but it's still the depth from defocus, depth from defocus technology that Panasonic has implemented on all of their mirrorless cameras. So you have contrast autofocus system, DFD technology. That's not exciting. That's not thrilling for anyone who is hoping for better autofocus from Panasonic. Maybe it's improved. Maybe they have some software mojo they can work up, but I wouldn't count on it. But basically this camera will do a lot of varieties of codecs, but really it's like 4K 60 and kind of your 
typical traditional type type uh, flare. It does have V-Log, I believe. Uh, it was in here that it has uh, V-Log. And it is a full frame camera. So I think this will sort of be like, oddly kind of like an, a full frame GH5, even though that's kind of what the S1 is, but the S5 has the flippy screen. They mentioned it in here. Maybe we should start at the top and just go through these. Cause it, like, look how long this is. This is the full specs for the S5. It's enormous. Let's start at the top and work our way down. And I'll skip over all the boring bits. So it is a digital single lens mirrorless camera. It's got the L mount. It's got a 35 millimeter full frame sensor. That's all good. We've got 24 megapixels. Uh, total pixels is 25. Okay, it's a three by two aspect ratio, great. It says 14 plus stops, a dynamic range with V-Log. That's good, but similar to what you have on the S1. Uh, recording formats, okay, you got JPEG and you've got RAW and then HLG photo, which is all right here. 6K photo mode, 4K photo mode. These are very familiar if you've had any kind of Lumix camera in the past. Of course, there's all the different aspect ratios and the, the resolutions that you could read through if you want. And of course, they have image quality adjustments, RAW, RAW fine, RAW standard, fine and standard, color space, sRGB, Adobe RGB. Okay, great. We got motion picture, recording file format, MOV, H.264, MPEG-4, AVC. Uh, we've got H.264, HEVC. Uh, no ProRes or anything fancy or special like that. This is not that type of camera. Maybe there'll be like an R5H that maybe could theoretically do some of that stuff. But I think in general, the R5, the biggest selling factor from the S1 is that it's smaller and lighter. It's kind of the main takeaway, which is kind of the main criticism, I would say, or common, not the main, a common criticism for the S1 is that it's just kind of big. So the S5 is a little bit smaller, but a lot of the same features. Of course, you got 4K uh, 30, 4K 24, you can do full HD with 60 frames a second, you can do 4K 60, uh, with 420 10-bit, that's great. Uh, it does have anamorphic modes, which is nice to see that their Panasonic is still implementing that. I think it's great, like, like clearly this software has been developed to do anamorphic. It should just be like part of the menu, part of the functionality. So I'm glad they're not, you know, crippling that and, and removing it. I do believe though, and somewhere in here, it says something about record time limits. So that's something to keep an eye on that if it's stopping recording artificially, like that's really annoying. We should be done with that. That shouldn't be a thing anymore. Stop it. Anyone who puts, you know, 30 minute timers on their record limits, just don't buy that camera. Like out of principle, it could be the best camera ever, but if you can only record for 30 minutes and then you have to re-roll, no, I don't, I don't want anything to do with that. That's a bunch of nonsense. We have MP4, again, full HD, MP4, great. You got PAL, NTSC, great, great, great. Slow and quick modes. So you can go all the way up. This is very familiar. You can go all the way up to 180 frames per second. If you go up to 180, the autofocus uh, is gonna be turned off for anything over 150. So this may be a situation where like max is really 120 and anything above that is kind of uh, a little bit of a, a manipulation like on the GH5. Everyone kind of knows 120, it looks good. And then beyond that, the, the image quality takes a hit in 1080p mode. So typically with the GH5, unless I absolutely need those extra 60 frames, I pretty much stay at 120 for any kind of slow-mo in 1080p. And then there's an APS-C mode, which is pixel by pixel, which is nice that they have this stuff. Just a lot of options for people who like to shoot different ways. And then and d depending on the lens you're using as well, maybe you only have an APS-C lens, which would be odd to put it on the L mount because you probably buy native glass, but if you're adapting, it's a good, good feature to have there as well as kind of that, that functionality to, to punch into a full frame lens. If you want to get a little bit of an extra kind of teleconverter mode, uh, the display speed goes up to 120 frames per second, uh, which is nice, you know, faster dis refresh rates on displays are always nice. So it looks a little bit less jittery and juttery but nothing crazy there. And again, reiterating that DFD technology, this is not, you know, phase detect autofocus. This is depth from defocus, which is the stupidest autofocus name. Everyone hates it. No one likes it. It's the, the Panasonic Achilles heel is their depth from defocus. Now here's what I'm hoping. I'm secretly hoping that Panasonic believes in this technology so much and they just haven't implemented it right. They're waiting for the software to catch up they know that depth from defocus is absolutely the best way to do autofocus. They just haven't implemented it right. This is what I'm hoping, fingers crossed, one day they'll nail it and it will blow everything else out of the water because it's actually the best way to do it. 
except none of that has been proven up into this point. It's pretty much clear it's the worst way to do it, but maybe they know something I don't know. I don't work for Panasonic. I have no way of knowing. Of course, you have different focus modes and shooting modes. Uh, let's keep moving on. This is where it gets a little bit into like the photography stuff. You can do light metering. Okay, great, 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 great. Metering exposure modes. You have your uh, ISO sensitivities all the way up to, you know, your crazy, uh, insanely high values, but you're probably going to go 6,400 max, maybe higher if you have to, but I mean, it's all pretty standardized nowadays. Like, yes, it does low and high ISO. Great. Uh, it does have dual native ISO and it does it where you can kind of select, which apparently on the S1, I, I never, I don't actually know of this problem myself, not owning an S1, but people have talked about that. Like it kind of auto flips your I ISO for you and you don't really have control over it. So this is supposedly a little bit better, but it's dual native ISO, which is becoming more and more common on almost every camera. If you've got Cine like D2, Cine like V2, great. Uh, we've got some auto modes. We've got internal stabilization. We got IBIS, which is awesome. You can do dual IS if you have a lens that's compatible. Also good. Although I don't know how many L mount lenses have stabilization. I was looking in the 24 to 70 doesn't. That's like I wish it did, um, but it's also not all that common. There's a lot of 24 to 70 lenses that don't, but. L mount lenses are not, there's not a lot of them. And with any with image stabilization, I'm, I don't know which ones those are. Probably like the 70 to 200 or like the long, long telephoto ones, but maybe not uh, some of the shorter focal lengths. Of course, we have self timer, remote control, silent mode. Great, great, great. Continuing on, trying to get through all this, we have burst. We've got uh, live view and all the 6K photo and 4K photo and all this stuff. And you can do your flash speed sync. And we've got more and more and more. There's a photo style, like, oh, you got an X teleconversion um, for different uh, shooting styles. If you wanna shoot a little bit longer, punch into the sensor. And then you get your filters. Okay, who cares? <laughs> um, you can do LUT displays on it, which is nice. And then um, we get kind of down here to like what the buttons do. <laughs> and they, Oh, you can, you can print from the camera. Hey, cool. Is there anyone doing that? Is there anyone just printing straight from the camera? Maybe in like a live event where you have to like print on demand. Maybe. It's nice that it's there, I suppose, but I probably a lot of cameras, I don't think I've ever printed an image directly from my camera before. I'm sure it's relevant for somebody. Uh, the HDMI on this is micro. Uh, I'm trying to find out where it says that. Micro HDMI. If that is just the saddest thing you've ever seen, like micro HDMI, come on, aren't we past micro HDMI? Can't everything just have SDI? HDMI is not all that great. I know it's very common. You can plug right into a TV and that's fantastic. There's definitely value there, but HDMI ugh, and micro gross. Let's keep going. You got an external microphone, headphone, uh, microphone, XLR microphone. Yes. If you have the adapter sold separately, keep that in mind. Uh, SD card slot, so we've got slot one, which is uh, UHS-2, basically, or what, you can go v video speed class 90, okay, and then slot two doesn't say that, so is slot two a slower, slower one, compatible with UHS-1, UHS speed class three, interesting, so the slots are kind of different, that's kind of odd, I'm trying to imagine why you would ever want that. So you do slot one for your video and slot two for photos, but they're different types of cards. Just make them the same slot. I don't know why it has to be different slots. I probably buy the, I probably will buy one card and use that same card, you know, or buy, you know, six of the same card. Why do I have to want to think about what slot goes, which goes in which slot? That's annoying. Bluetooth, that's good. Of course, you probably will be able to sync it with the Lumix app, which is nice and handy if you've never used any kind of mobile app with your phone, almost all the, uh, the cameras do that where they sync with a phone and it's very helpful if you're shooting just by yourself and you want to get things in focus and just check exposure and change things on the fly. I highly recommend it, especially for those remote viewing situations. It's kind of a pain usually to get it all set up and working, but once you get it, it is very helpful in certain situations. Battery, continuous recordable time. So it says approximately 110 minutes. What does that mean? Continuous recordable time. Is that like the battery will die because approximately, and then MOV mode, it's a little bit lower. 
is the card going to be full? Is this based off of some, like, it's a 64 gigabyte card and you can record for 100 minutes? Because it gives you a codec there. So I assume there isn't any record limit, but it is odd the way this is written. It's kind of giving you, like, an example. And then actual recordable time, 55 minutes, 55 minutes, 50 minutes. What's the... What's the difference between? I don't, this doesn't make sense. I don't know. It probably makes sense to somebody. I just don't know what value it serves here. And then operating temperature. Of course, if this looks funny or silly, because we've been talking a lot about cameras getting hot, but this is pretty standard. Zero to 40 degrees Celsius. Fairly common on pretty much every uh, camera of this class. And uh, here's your weight and dimensions, which is the, uh, the kind of thing they, uh, S5, is known for compared to the S1. It'd be a little bit smaller, a little bit more lightweight, which is nice. It's nice to see more full frame offerings from Panasonic. Does this set the world on fire? No, absolutely not. This is pretty generic, let's say. They're not doing anything revolutionary there, but it also doesn't say the price. We don't know how much this thing will cost. If this thing is entry level and it's only like $1,000, hey, maybe that's a bargain for a full frame photography video camera, right? thousand dollars that's cheaper than the gh5 right now gh5 brand new is still 1300 bucks so if they could get to that kind of like canon rp thousand dollar entry level full frame that would be fantastic are they going to do that probably not it'll probably be like two thousand dollars or something like that um maybe somewhere in between i don't know i'm just speculating at this point on the price We'll see once it's finally announced. Again, this is all leaks. So theoretically, this could all be wrong. But would someone really take the time to write this much up, like a full spec sheet for, for fake news? I kind of doubt it. This is probably legitimate. And it looks okay. It's fine. I'm sure it'll appeal to somebody. It's just like, if it is that kind of like cheaper, cheaper style camera, just entry level, but also nothing to get too terribly excited about. If you are considering the A7S III or you wish the R5 or R6 didn't have the overheating issues and you were looking to like a full frame mirrorless camera, come on Panasonic. That's not probably the S5, unfortunately. But maybe something else will come out at the same time. Maybe there'll be like a dual announcement. Like we have dual native ISO. Maybe there'll be like dual camera announcement. That'd be kind of cool, a GH6. I'd love to see a GH6, come on. Announce it. Let us know what it is. It's, it's time. We're past due for it. Let us know. I really want to see a GH6 because I think I'd be more excited about that than the S5. But hey, if you didn't know the S5 was coming, now you do. Who cares about the S5? I'm curious. Who in the chat cares about the S5? How would I compare this to the A7S3? Are talking about the S5 in that scenario? I wasn't reading the chat when I was reading the article. I try not to do that. I try and split them up because I'll clip it as a separate video for the people who don't want to watch the live stream, but all the people watching the live stream, you're in the right spot. How would I compare it to the A7S III? Uh, A7S III, I would definitely prefer over the R5, me personally. Uh, if any of you have learned your craft depending on autofocus camera systems and want to graduate into live broadcast, you have to learn manual focus and work without focus pullers. That's true, Eugene. It's true. You got you to gotta be able to do both. And there are definitely times where autofocus is very helpful, very handy, and a great asset to have. I mean, for photography, it's, it's very helpful. And there's certain situations for video, it's helpful as well. But it, has it been a limitation for me the past last three and a half years with the GH5? No, not, not really at all. Um, there may be a handful of times where I wish I had better autofocus, but in general, manual has been just fine. I'm still happy with the GX85. Yeah, there's some definitely other, you know, kind of lower level, you know, comparable GH5 equivalents. The G9 is one that people often talk about. The G9 is basically a GH5. I don't have a G9, so I can't speak to it. Uh, the GH5 came out first. It was an obvious choice for me. And then the G9 came and I think that's great to make it a little bit more affordable for the people who are budget conscious and they want similar features in a little cheaper package. I think that's great. Uh, well, they should wait until that time comes to put that autofocus system in their cameras then. Micro HDMI, sad. Yeah, different card slot, sad. Overheat, I guess. Uh, I'm late here. RT365, you're, you're right on time. This is the time to be here. Uh, you can always go back and, and watch it from the beginning if you really want, but I, I think you're at the right time. 
And then the phenomenal life says, I do. I don't know what that's in, in response to. So who knows? But S5, I know it's a little boring. It's a little underwhelming. But I thought I'd point it out because it is movement in the S line, which I think is nice that they're trying. I got to see the price. If it's $1,000, that's probably a bargain. That's probably a steal for someone who wants like, if you told somebody like, who would this camera be for? It's probably not for us. It's probably for that person that's like, I want to get into photography. What camera should I buy? And you say, well, you know, Sony's got the, you know, the A7S III that's coming out, but it's 12 megapixels. And if you want to get into photography, maybe you're looking at something more like from Canon, you know, the R5, the R6, but those are still kind of expensive. So maybe you're looking at like the RP, but that's like, you know, looking kind of dated now. So maybe the S5 is for that type of person where it's like, I just, I want to get into photography. I know I want full frame, but which one do I get? And it's like the cheapest one. If it's like, if it's the cheapest one, then fantastic. But the fact that it's got vlog and a few other features, I, I don't think that's going to be the case. I don't think so. We'll see. Who knows? Let's see. Uh, Tube Man says, I rock the GH5 and the only thing holding me back is a poor low light performance. Interesting. Interesting. What situations are you in where you have low light? Is this like weddings where you have no control over the light? Or is this a situation where you could do something to change the lighting situation? And then Eugene follows up. In broadcast sports, we use a lot of unmanned remote cameras like goal cams. If the GH5 or GH6 had SDI, Panasonic could sell a ton uh, because they're way cheaper than the mini cameras we use now. Interesting. I feel like that's like the black magic realm for like the micro, the micro box cameras. I don't think the Z cam has SDI on it. I don't know. I feel like there are those like little boxy cameras that just SDI out and like that's it. Uh, if the GH5 or GH6 had an SDI, I would love it if it did because I would just use that connection a whole lot more than HDMI. HDMI just feels so flimsy. It's so easy to pull out and lose feed and God forbid you are relying on an external recorder and the cable gets yanked. Like, it's just really irritating. Uh, SDI is much better. But then there's often times where like on the Ursa Mini, I wish it had HDMI so I could just hook it up to a TV, but it only has SDI. So it's, you know, you run it through like an Atomos or something, and then you can convert, you can cross convert from SDI to HDMI or vice versa, I'm pretty sure, uh, which is a helpful little functionality of those monitors. If you uh, don't know that, like you can, on the Atomos, at least on the Shogun Inferno, you can run uh, SDI in and then output that same signal uh, over HDMI, which is helpful in those situations where you want to hook a camera up to a TV so people can see what you're filming. Like a client, imagine that. And who's going to buy a giant, super expensive SDI client monitor when you can buy, you know, a TV for 200 bucks? Or there's probably one already there because everybody's got TVs everywhere. Let's see. You asked who cares. Oh, that's <laughs> something I asked. I posed the question. I wasn't watching the chat when I was reading, so I, I, I don't. Maybe, do you want the, R, the uh, S5? Maybe, maybe. We'll see. I also want to talk about cameras, industry type stuff. Canon rumors posted, so we'll talk about this. I talked in another video about the popularity of certain camera brands, camera systems, based on social media, looking at their follower counts, looking at reviews on Google and on Amazon, kind of a non-scientific way to just evaluate like who's into these brands, like how popular are they really, how well are they selling? Well. Oddly enough, I do that video, and then Canon Rumors posts the 2019 global camera market share numbers are out, and Canon leads the way, which aligns pretty closely to what we were looking at the other day with you know, social media influence and reviews around these camera systems, although Sony is definitely up there. And on the list, we have the big three are still the big three, but there's a new number two being Sony. So Canon, uh, according to, to this report, has 45% of the global camera market share. That is staggering. Almost 50% of the global camera market is Canon, but I believe it. You go out in the wild and you see people shooting and it's Canon, Canon, Canon everywhere. Everyone's got the Canon neck straps. Sony, 20%. 
far, far lower down uh, compared to Canon, but surpassing Nikon, who's at 18.6%. Now we get to the, the, the sad, disappointing stuff of Fujifilm and Panasonic, both at 4.7%. And this aligns pretty well with the kind of social media numbers we were looking at. All this is in relation to is not to say like, oh, Canon's the best because they're number one, or look at Sony, they're number two, ha 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 ha. It's just to say like, this is where these companies sit because I've made a few videos talking about why, you know, Panasonic keeps losing, why Sony keeps winning and Canon keeps failing. And although Canon by the numbers isn't failing, Sony is definitely winning, creeping up the charts and Panasonic keeps losing kind of there at the bottom. And this is, you know, data reports, not just let's look at social media followers. So it says, interestingly, Canon increased their market share over 2018 by 2.4%. However, the overall market contract contracted by 22.4%. So they have a larger piece of a smaller pie. Again, is that probably from smartphone sales and people just using cameras on their smartphone? Probably. Is it people just knowing that Canon is a brand of camera that's very popular? Yes. The Canon brand goes a long way even if they're not releasing the most cutting edge cameras. I mean, they are in some ways for photography, but Sony has been hot on their heels for a long time with mirrorless, you know, and the, and the technology that's allowed there, which is better kind of autofocus and tracking and all that stuff. And now Canon is, is finally in that realm as well. So staying competitive. And I think it's interesting to talk about because it just goes to show you that just because something's number one doesn't mean it's the best, nor does making the best product necessarily get you to number one. It's a variety of factors that we're always talking about. From my personal perspective, Canon keeps failing because they keep dropping the ball on all these cameras, but for many people, they're, they're solid home runs. They're winning, like they'll keep buying Canon, they have Canon glass, and they'll buy Canon to the day they die. And in that transition gap, you have a lot of people who are switching to Sony people who are leaving Nikon, maybe people are leaving not buying cameras anymore just in general because maybe they're fine with what they have. Maybe they have a 5D Mark III and they don't need to buy anything new. Or maybe they have a Sony you know, A7 III and then that's good enough. Although it'd probably be more like an A7 II or something, you know, a little bit older uh, for this report in terms of those, those number changes. But I do think it's interesting, the long-term effect of some of these things because just because you're number one now doesn't mean you're gonna be number one forever. And just because you're at the bottom of the list doesn't mean you'll be there forever. It's about the continual growth over time. Canon for a long, long time and Nikon as well were top dogs, best of the best, number one, number two, Canon and Nikon, and that was the argument. And now Sony in such a relatively short period of time has made it to number two. And in a lot of ways you see people leaving Canon for Sony because they're just making these incredibly powerful cameras that give people the features they want. Are they the best cameras? No, there is no best camera. It's the best tool for the job. It's the best camera for the individual because they know the jobs they're gonna use it for. Why does Panasonic keep losing? Well, it's they're kind of late to the party in a lot of ways. Their autofocus isn't all that great. They weren't doing full frame until just recently. So there's a lot of like foundational setbacks even though Micro Four Thirds, I think, is a pretty compelling system for a lot of people. Hey, these cameras are smaller and lighter. The lenses are smaller and lighter. They're cheaper overall. They can actually do some higher end video stuff that the full frame ones haven't been able to do. They're just now catching up. But also too, when someone's asking what camera should I buy, you know, some beginner photographer or someone just getting into it, almost everyone is gonna be faced with that okay, well, you're gonna go from your smartphone and you're gonna be going to kind of an interchangeable lens system. And they're gonna go, what? Like, I gotta buy lenses now? What are you talking about? And they're just like, yeah. I mean, there are some cameras with fixed lenses, but really if you wanna have the best image quality, which people usually just associate with a blurry background, you're gonna say, well, you're gonna need a fast lens and you have to explain aperture. And then you're gonna, right alongside that conversation, you're gonna to have to explain sensor size. And the moment someone hears, oh, full frame, like that's, that's the good one, well, yeah, because like APS-C has some uses for, you know, wildlife or sports or something where you don't, you want a little bit longer, you know, reach with your lens. But yeah, in general, full frame is going to give you the best quality. They go, okay, great. What's the, what's the full frame camera I should get? They're not even going to consider micro four third. 
Because then you say, well, I mean, if you want something that's, you know, cheaper and a little bit more lightweight and they go, yeah, but that's not like, that's not professional though. And it's like, well, some professionals use it. It's like, yeah, but like at the NFL, what do they use at, you know, at, at sporting events, at a wedding I went to, I saw they had a Canon camera. That's like the best one, right? Well, best is, is hard to say, but it, it makes sense why people just gravitate towards Canon, but the people also leave Canon and go maybe towards Sony or something else. And Panasonic and Fujifilm have a long way to catch up. However, they're doing, in my mind, Fujifilm and Panasonic are doing the right things as far as offering, I mean, Fujifilm with you know, the GFX 100 going like medium format, okay, beyond full frame. Let's go medium format. Let's put video on the thing. Let's go crazy. It'll be expensive, but like we can start attracting some of these like you know, the, the ambassadors for lack of a better word, or like the influencers, the people who talk about these things day in and day out and use them and then are talking to other people and they see, oh, this is what this person's using. And Panasonic too, with, you know, the S1 line, the S1R, the S1H, having features that no one else is doing in hybrids, at least at, at that time. And even still to this day, even with the announcements of the A7S3 and the R5 and the R6, they're doing things that are unique and innovative in a way that appeal to maybe more niche demographics, but they create really powerful tools that get a lot of like brand affinity in that people get attached to the brand because it's like doing something that no one else is doing. If you want to take high quality photos, you can do that with pretty much any camera, even from the last 10 years, probably you can take high quality photos. It's the other things around that hybrid system that matter the most. Is it the autofocus? Is it the stabilization? Is it the low light? Is it the codec, the color science, which is sort of debatable about how that much that matters. But for a regular, maybe average person, it, it matters a lot. Of they're just they're just shooting JPEGs and they want them to look great. Is it the you know the size, the weight, the the feature set, the usability, how it looks, how it feels? All this stuff is really really important for getting people to like think beyond just taking a picture because there's plenty of cameras that can take pictures really, really well. And they keep getting better and better and better in terms of autofocus and speed and you know frames per second and all that. It keeps getting better, but it's not like you know a camera from five years ago is gonna take bad photos. However, a hybrid camera from five years ago is probably gonna take much more inferior video. The video features still have a lot of area to grow in terms of the codecs, in terms of autofocus, in terms of stabilization and uh, resolution and frames per second, frame rates and whatnot. So I, I think it's interesting to see how each of these companies have kind of approached it and, and the things they're doing currently and maybe where they'll go in the future to maybe see, like, is this the chart we'll be looking at five, 10 years from now? Probably, but who knows? Maybe not. I don't know. We'll see. I did think it was good to talk about, though, in the context of you can do it with social media and reviews and, and Google analytics and all that stuff, but you can also just look at the you know sales reports, more or less, of, of the market share of these companies and how much they actually influence the, the group as a whole of the, or the industry as a whole. There's a lot more Canon photographers out there than anything else. They're basically half of the industry is Canon and the other half is everybody else. That's massive. But don't count Sony out because they're creeping up the charts pretty fast for, you know, how, I mean, they got into mirrorless first and earliest, but they're still late to the game compared to Canon and Nikon. And then Panasonic and Fuji are also doing some fun, interesting stuff. So I like looking at all these brands. They all have something interesting to offer. And it's really is, there is no best camera. It's just about picking the right tool for the right job. And usually that comes down to you, the person who's using the tool, deciding what's going to work best for you. There's definitely a lot of stuff out there, a lot of choices, a lot of options. GH5 and G9 at 1200 and 1000 are like, uh, at the best price with a uh, Viltrox and Sigma 18 to 35 best overall $2,000 from Lincoln. Yes. Yes. Um, I haven't used the G9 myself, so I, I don't know, but I hear great things. Not going to buy a new camera. Going to stick with the Sony FS5. Great camera with raw and the Atomos Shogun 7. Yeah, absolutely. If you have a camera that does what you need it to do, you don't have to buy just a new camera every year or every two years just because there's new stuff out. Wait till there's a meaningful upgrade 
that's going to change the way you work. Panasonic were actually behind Olympus in last year's report and now overtook them, so it's not all bad. Hey, that's good to know. I should I could have referenced that, I suppose, over the years. Who's who's going where? Uh, RT365 says, I'm very happy with my A6300 waiting on Sony to bring an APS-C with 4K60. That'd be, I'm, sure, I'm sure it will come eventually. I don't know how long you have to hold your breath, but it'll probably come. It'll come, I'm sure. The last thing I want to talk about, for this stream anyway, was some of the stuff around the R5. I know that I'm... I don't know. I don't, I don't know how kind I should be, how much grace I should give Canon with what they're doing. But hopefully, I can put a video into context for the people who think that I just, I just want a video camera. That's not what I want. But it bring it, it got me thinking about some stuff. So let's talk about that. I don't know what to say to the people who will defend Canon no matter what with the R5 and the R6 overheating. I mean, this is this is reported. The R5 and the R6, they have heating problems. Will this be fixed? Could be. I hope so. I personally wanted to buy an R5 or an R6 based on the specs that Canon said were going to be available in these cameras. And then the previews and the reviews hit and people said, it's not actually that usable for video. Photography is great, and that's awesome. I love a good photography camera. I would love the 45 megapixels. I'd love to use the R5 in all its glory, but you just, you can't all the time. And I understand that people, you know, say it's a photography camera. If you want a video camera, just go buy a real video camera, like the, the Ursa Mini Pro, right? Like that's not what I want though. Like I have that. I want something that's a hybrid that does it all in one box. And people say that's impossible. Canon and the R5, it's, in, it's, it's 45 megapixels. What do you expect? They just can't do it. It's not physically possible. And the thing to remember in that situation is that the R6 also overheats and that's a 20 megapixel sensor. The S1H is a 24 megapixel sensor. So it's not about just the megapixels, it's about the way these cameras were designed, where they're built. It could have been intentional. People say, people wanna say, this is Canon crippling these cameras to protect their cinema EOS line. That could be. It could be total ignorance. We just don't know why these things are happening. The fact is they are happening, and we can theorize and, and question and say, why did this happen? Well. If you look at the design of it, it looks like they didn't do a lot in terms of thermal management. Maybe you say, well, they couldn't. It was, it was impossible to have it sealed, to do all the stuff. It's impossible. And it's 45 megapixels. And it's like, okay, so that's why I want to focus on the R6. Because the R6, in my mind, is the real tragedy. The R6 could have been that just like, just perfect all around a hybrid camera that works for everybody. You don't need the 8K RAW. Maybe you don't even need 4K 120 on the R5. And maybe the R5 is 45 megapixels and it just overheats because it's the nature of 45 megapixels. But with 20 megapixels, you're telling me that they couldn't figure out 4K 60 with 20 megapixels. It was impossible. Canon couldn't do it. Meanwhile, Sony's doing 4K 120 from 12 megapixels, so that's less. But Canon, this premium, amazing company, couldn't get the R6 in a, in a functional state for the people who do both photo and video, who want a hybrid camera. I don't always want to lug a giant cinema camera around or have something that just does video because I might want to do photography as well on the same shoot. And to not be able to criticize this, I think is a little unfair in Canon's favor, if you say you can't criticize Canon, they're doing the best they can, these cameras are meant for photography first and foremost, which f fine, I'll accept you at that argument, but you should still be able to criticize them for their lack of a, of, of, a, of a fault, of a detriment to the camera system. And the absolute equation the, on the other side that I would use to this is Panasonic and how bad their autofocus is compared to Canon and Sony. Panasonic is criticized, drug through the mud for how bad their autofocus is, and I'll never buy a Panasonic because their autofocus is terrible. That is fair, that is a fair criticism. Like, you, well, if you could make arguments and say, well, they don't have the technology, oh, give them a break, yada, yada, and people do, but to not admit that it's a problem. I think everybody who defends Panasonic says, yeah, the autofocus is bad on these Lumix cameras, but 
I like all the other features instead. And I don't see that same understanding from the people who want to defend Canon in the R5 and R6 situation. If you say, yeah, it sucks these things overheat, I wish they didn't, but I'll get it for you know the photography modes, totally fine. Totally fine and fair argument. But if you say, oh no, if you want a video camera, buy a real video camera then. These are photography cameras. That's like, that's the leap too far because you could say the exact same thing about Panasonic and it's like, oh, if you want autofocus, well then just buy a photography camera. It's like, well, yeah, I am. I'm buying a hybrid because it's for photography. Like I want the autofocus to work, you know, like I, it's fair. It's a criticism. And it's so weird to me that these things aren't equally valued, that like it's okay to criticize Panasonic for their bad autofocus, which I admit it is bad comparatively to Canon and Sony, which do much, much better. And then it's not okay to criticize Canon for a camera that overheats, not even the R5. I'll give it to them. The R5, yeah, it overheats. 45 megapixels is impossible to keep cool. All right, great. But what about the R6? And why are these recovery times so crazy? They didn't they didn't factor any of this into when they when they put these specs out there and they said the R5 and R6 are, you know, to be there, the R5 right along Hollywood as a B camera for, you know, your cinema cinema line. They said this stuff. So why isn't it a valid criticism? I genuinely am curious. I don't understand why it's okay to criticize Panasonic for the autofocus, but it's not okay to criticize Canon for maybe their their design, or maybe maybe we'll find out that it's truly confirmed that there's some software manipulation going on and these cameras really aren't overheating. Because apparently, you know, people are talking about you can record externally without cards in the R5. So clearly the camera can do it, it just can't process it to a, a memory card. Is that a, a firmware loophole or bug and your sensor is going to be degraded over time? I know there's a lot of thought around, well, the sensor heating up is just bad for the sensor in terms of image performance. And that's true. I live in Phoenix, Arizona. You don't want to be doing time lapses, you know, like long exposure photography when it's 115 out. You're going to get a lot more noise interference than if it's a nice cold night. So heat is definitely a factor for sensors. It matters, but when you look at the internals of the R5 and you say, oh, they didn't really do any thermal management here. Like they, maybe they could have done something better. There's an article over on Canon News that, you know, spells out pretty plainly from their perspective that, oh, it was impossible. There was nothing they could have done. And I think the R6, surely, surely the R6 could have been spared in all this. But no, that's the real tragedy. I think a lot of people would understand the R5 if it just is pushing the limits and the boundaries. Full frame, 45 megapixels is impressive. 8K RAW, 4K 120, these are impressive specs for the R5. But the R6 should have and could have been that amazing in-between beautiful hybrid that would have, everyone would have embraced and loved and bought more Canon lenses and just celebrated how amazing the R6 is. And yet, even that is plagued by overheating to the point where you have to ba drop it down to 1080. In 2020, you have to shoot with a $2,500 camera in 1080p mode. And that, to me, is just the point where you, if it's, if it's malice, if they did it intentionally to protect the cinema line, then shame on them. If it's ignorance and they just don't know how to do it, or they didn't want to, or they didn't care to, also shame on them. I, I, don't, I don't know how you how you defend it and say it's just a photography camera. Because you could say the same thing about Panasonic and the autofocus. Is, well, it's just a video camera. You don't even need autofocus. Why do you need autofocus? Aren't you good enough to use manual focus? Way back when, there wasn't autofocus. Everyone was manual focusing. A lot of lenses don't even have autofocus and they're manual focus only. So why do you need autofocus? If you're a real photographer, you don't need autofocus. See, there's always crazy arguments you can come up and spin up to like defend one way or the other. I think it's fair in any situation to criticize and point out and just say, hey, this is a problem. Why is it a problem? F figure it out. People are pulling these cameras apart, testing them, trying to figure out why is this an issue? Can we fix it? Is there something we can do as shooters, as, as owner operators to fix these problems? Same thing with Panasonic. There were people digging through those menus, trying to optimize the autofocus on all the Lumix cameras always because it's like, oh, if you if you get these settings, do negative three and then plus one, and then that'll be the perfect autofocus for this situation. But and it's like you can 
you can do it to death, but at the end of the day, it's still a criticism that the autofocus isn't all that great and it's not that reliable. So that should encourage the camera manufacturer to say, well, we gotta figure this out. And, say, and likewise for Canon, like they gotta figure it out because these cameras should be able to do these things, should be able to. The R5, again, counting that one out, that one's, no, that one's off the table, fine, I'll give it to you. Let's talk about the R6. It's a tragedy that that's not a better camera because it really should be. It's a beast. It's a, it's a can of worms talking about the Canon cameras because people don't want to hear it. And I know I'm not the sunshine and rainbows guy talking about how great Canon is and oh, it's amazing and they're autofocus. Like there's plenty of people to do that. And there's also plenty of people to talk about that they're not usable. So don't get me wrong, there's people on both sides. But it's the, it's, I don't know why the defense is, we'll just go buy a video camera. Like that's a terrible argument. It's not even an argument. It's just like, that's not what, it's a hybrid. Like you want it because it does things that a video camera doesn't. That's why you want it, because it does both. Let's see what's going on in the chat. Uh, the problem is the R5 was sold as a hybrid and should be criticized as such. If it was sold as a stills camera, it needs to be cheaper to compete. I agree with that. If, and, and the R6, it's really about the R6 for me. I told you the R6 is crippled, yep. The R6 will overheat even at 24 frames per second, yep. I still see wedding photographers ask for videographers that shoot Canon. They say for the autofocus or color science. But when other cameras shoot 10-bit or RAW. Well, it depends, Steve. So if it's a wedding, I imagine they're probably doing like quick turnaround type stuff. And they probably, these people, I imagine, probably don't want to spend a lot of time color, color grading, color correcting. So it might be important for them just to have it baked in. Uh, that's all I can imagine that like, they just don't want to wait for someone to grade, you know, log footage or whatnot. And then theoretically, if they're shooting Canon and the videos Canon, it all can kind of match and be cohesive. Theoretically, I, I could understand sort of the logic there of just keeping it a unified system for like the whole, the whole wedding production. But I don't know. It's the R6. I would have, I would have bought it if it did just what it, actually, I would have bought the R5 if it did what it said. The R6, I could have been sort of swayed and say, okay, well, I don't need the 120. And the R6 is the interesting situation because compared to the A7S III, theoretically, you're saving $1,000, let's say, between the Sony A7S III and the R6, saving 1,000, but you're actually getting 20 megapixels compared to Sony's 12, and you lose out on some of the video features, but I think the R6 is, is probably a better hybrid if it actually worked as intended, because it really balances both really nicely, where the A7S III definitely favors video more for and, and low light for that matter. But you know, 12 megapixels, I get some people that's not enough. And having 20, I think is in that sweet spot. For most people, 20 is a good amount of resolution for photography. You get the beautiful Canon autofocus, you get stabilization, you get the color science if that's important to you, you know, not doing any kind of uh, heavy color grading with uh, log or, you know, 10 bit or raw. So I think the R6 really could have captured a lot of people. And even that one, they botched it. Maybe they'll fix it. I don't know. And if they do, maybe people will forgive them, I guess. I don't know. Like it's a good, it'll, if they fix it, it will be a good camera. And it is a good camera. And that's the tragedy that you can't use the good features on the good camera. Let's see, they aren't editing the video though. Oh, interesting, so like you would be the one editing the video for the wedding and just delivering it? I don't know, maybe they've just worked with uh, Panasonic shooters in the past and stuff was out of focus, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, let's see, uh, the RAS R3 has a 12 minute record limit at 12 frames per second before you need to change the film mag. <laughs> Funny, funny stuff. Yes, your your cards can get full, especially if you're shooting 8K RAW on the R5, right? Your cards are going to get full really, really quick. So you're going to have to stop and restart. Eugene says, I'm a manual focus guy, but I shall not upgrade from the GH5 to a system without a kick-ass autofocus system. I, Eugene, I'm kind of at that same point. So with the GH5, I'm at the point where I am looking towards something that is full frame. I do value that. 
maybe not as heavily as some people do because like obviously those people probably bought Sony in the past. I think it has has value, it has merit, and I would like something that is full frame now that it should be a little bit more, it should be easier. I'm not a camera manufacturer. I don't design these things for a living, but I would imagine they've, the technology should have gotten to the point where the features that I want should be available in a full frame camera. And they are in the S1H. It's there, hands down. The S1H is there. I'm just waiting every day for a price drop on the freaking S1H because if they drop that price, whew, I might, I might have to do it. And someone said, I think, you know, if you get the, uh, if you, if you know a college student or something, you can get the uh, college discount over there on uh, B&H and it's like 500 bucks off. I don't know if that's helpful for anyone, if you know any college students, but uh, I guess that's one way to go about it. You could buy used as well, but I think just in general, dropping the price and then so to drop those other prices down would be beneficial for the you know Panasonic system. Because the S1H is a great camera, but it just feels like a big, a big buy Basically a year later, you know, we're out from that camera when, when people were first starting to get their hands on it. Let's see. How about the Ursa Mini Pro 12K Blackmagic claims you can edit on a laptop? Uh, the raw footage uh, 12K? Because I don't actually know on the 12K, can you do um, ProRes 12K? Or is like are all the high-end resolutions available for raw only? Let's see. Let's take a look. Let's Let's go down the rabbit hole, shall we? Ursa Mini Pro 12K, bouncing over here. Oh, I ended up on their site. I thought I was going to B&H. Uh, workflow design accessories, OS, raw, tech specs. That's where we want to go. All right, lens mount, high speed frame rates. You can do 12K 60, which is great. 8K 110, 4K 110, 8K 140, yeah, yeah, yeah. built-in and field filters, dynamic range, shooting resolutions. See, I don't like how any of these, like B&H always seems to have the best, I'll click on their ad, the best, oh, but this is for the 4.6K. Um, where's the 12K? If I just search 12K, it does the, uh, oh, it's going to do that. 12K. Is it, let's see, let's see. I like how B&H does their specs. It usually seems to be a little bit easier to read. Is there, so this is the PL. Surely there's an EF version, isn't there? And there must be. I honestly haven't looked at the 12K all that much. Uh, having the Ursa Mini 4.6K, and that's more than enough for me right now. So the 12K is like far beyond. And then it's more expensive too. So it's, let's see. So 12K up to 60, 8K up to 110, 8K, 4K, 140, 6K, 120, 4K, 220, and windowed. Raw recording. Okay, so there's all your raw modes. And is there, so is there no ProRes anymore on the 12K? Is that true? There's no ProRes? Come on, no. Really? That'd be crazy. None of the lenses I like to shoot with have autofocus. So, yeah, well, that's... That's the nature of it. I took my R5 to shoot in 72 degree weather, shot 100 pictures in 10 minutes of 4K 60 clips in one hour. I got the overheating symbol and it said I had one minute of 4K 60 left. Can't do normal dad stuff. <laughs> yeah, it's sad. It's sad. Yeah, 12K on a laptop. Uh, B-RAW has better compression than even ProRes. Is that true as well? I'm, I'm not aware of the magic of B-RAW then uh, if it is even better than ProRes, but like what flavor of ProRes? Cause if you're talking about ProRes HQ, sure. But like ProRes Lite as well, is that what you're talking about? If the S1H had Sony or Canon's autofocus, no one would even care about the R5 and the A7S. I assume you mean three, unless they have small hands. Yeah, oh yeah. Panasonic needs to get their autofocus game together and then just keep doing what they're doing. Cause that, that's like, that's it. That's the only thing, everything else pretty much off the charts and they do it better than, than anybody else in terms of offering proper video features in a hybrid. I bought a GH1 two weeks ago, returned it the next day since the L to EF mount won't do autofocus on video and surely not a GH1. Is that what you're talking about? 
an L to EF mount. No, it's got to be the S1H is what you're talking about. I thought the GH1 was a perfect camera, but they have limited lenses. You can't be talking about the GH1. There's no way you bought a GH1 two weeks ago. <laughs> S1H, probably. I'm going to assume. Uh, let's see. The L to EF mount won't do autofocus on video and limits most features. Oh, sure, sure. But you're doing autofocus on the GH1, uh, on the S1H in video mode? I mean, uh, I suppose that's maybe not. Uh, you, yeah, I mean, that's fair, but the S1H isn't known for good autofocus anyway in video mode, so you're really not missing out on much if the adapter doesn't do it. Uh, when I had the S1H, I did run into a problem with the MC21, that's the Sigma adapter. It didn't register the, is it like a, it's a cheap 85 millimeter lens. It's like off-brand like uh, Mikey, I think, Miki, I don't know how you say it. Can pros handle 12K spec? I don't know. I love B-Raw, Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera. 6K has 3 to 1, 5 to 1, 8 to 1, and 12 to 1 compression. Amazing. Yes, the S1H. So yeah, if you've got uh, the compression all set up, and like, I would have to compare it, honestly. ProRes is so easy, because you don't need any, like, you don't need a special, I, I know there's like a Blackmagic Raw kind of plug-in for Premiere that you can use and get it all set it up. Uh, I probably just have to take the time to do it and test it and see what the uh, the record limit, actually, I mean, we could do it, in, well, I'll do, I'll do it another night. Um, and we could talk about that stuff. Because you could just test right in the camera, right? Just see like how, how long the, the card will last based on, on what settings you put it into. I'm waiting for a Blackmagic Pocket Cinema camera to come out with autofocus features. That's all I need. Yeah, I think Blackmagic is in a really good spot if they play their cards right and they do something. The Pocket Cinema camera is so good in so many ways. They just need to refine it fix the battery issues because that's immediate. Everyone always talks about the battery. That's a problem. I wish and I hope they f they do something with the screen too because I don't, I love the big screen on there. I don't like that you can't flip it around. You can't do anything with it. I would take a smaller screen that's more flexible than the, you know, the, the just the flat, you know, you, it's stuck on the back of the camera. And nowadays it's just so valuable to have a screen that can kind of go any direction. Steve says you seriously need to check it out. B-Raw has 12 to 1, all the compression in the video where he shows the 12K edit on the laptop was to demonstrate the efficiency of B-Raw. I will check it out, absolutely. This is what I love. Like people, you know, some people keep talking about the Fuji X-T4, but then they don't give me a reason to like test it out or like why I should care. They just say, oh, look at the X-T4. It's like, no, if you, if it's the best, like, yeah, like give it a reason. And if it's better than ProRes, for sure. Uh, but it would, it would, I'd have to compare it to which level of ProRes because that, that's the thing, right? There's so many different types of ProRes. Um, and it'd be, it would just be that like the file size to the value per project. You know, there's sometimes where, yeah, uncompressed raw is like way overkill and you, it's, it's not worth it. It's too expensive. But if you're dealing with like 12 to one compression and you look at those file sizes, I don't know. We'll see. I'll play around with it and test it out. Maybe, uh, I don't know, maybe tomorrow night or another night I'll, uh, I'll play around with the good old Ursa. It's a great camera. Love the Ursa Mini Pro and the, the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema camera for that matter. Like if I didn't have a GH5 already at that time, probably even today, I'm you know still tempted by the Pocket Cinema camera because they're so nice. But then I think having to do all the add-ons of like, you know, SSD recording, like having that set up and granted you don't have to do it that way, but then definitely needing some kind of power supply, like squid octopus attached to the camera just to shoot it regularly. That's where it takes it away from like, okay, this isn't fun anymore. Like the GH5, I can bring on vacation. I can bring it to a shoot. I can bring it anywhere and it does pretty much everything I would want. Whereas if it's like the pocket cinema camera, I'm like, oh, now I have to like bring this extra stuff with me and I have to set it up every time and you have to rig it out, and, and then you have to do some kind of external screen monitoring because you want to flip that around. Someone, a uh, guy with camera says, tilt a screen mod. Is there a tilt a screen mod for the uh, Pocket Cinema camera? I'm not aware of it. B-Raw 12 to 1 compression is what I use for my video, and you can't tell the difference between 3 to 1 and 12 to 1. Blackmagic Pocket Cinema camera is best in color science, just waiting for continuous autofocus. Yeah, I mean, I love the way Blackmagic footage just looks and grades. And with RAW, if that's a good way to do it, I'd be curious what the, the file sizes actually are and the difference. Like, what, what is the equivalent 
of B raw twelve to one, what is the pro ProRes equivalent? Is that like ProRes Lite? Is that ProRes Proxy? Is that ProRes four two two? That's why I was surprised you preferred ProRes RAW over B RAW. You can even shoot some compression SD cards in the pocket 4K and still have tons of latitude. Oh no, like I don't, I don't prefer ProRes RAW. I've never used it myself. Um, I've heard good things about people, and I've wanted to test it out with like the S1H, but I don't have an external recorder to do that, so I didn't get a chance to with the S1H. If Sigma are totally committed to releasing more of their um, art glass, like their lovely new 85 1.4 for the L mount, that definitely helps the S1H. Yeah, the new 85 L mount uh, 1.4 looks really nice, especially compared to the old one, which seems like just the, the old Sigma lens with like basically an adapter built in. The new one that's designed for L mount looks a lot nicer. Pocket Cinema camera is pretty big as well. Yeah. Um, so I've, I've shot with the 4k, I haven't shot with the 6k, but I shot with the 4k and a speed booster and it's big, it's wide, but like the S1H was just big in like one hand. I don't mind the width of the pocket cinema camera. The name is terrible cause you, there's no way you're putting that thing in your pocket, but, uh, I didn't mind the size all that much. It was fine. It'd like, you, it would fit in a backpack. It would fit in a bag. It's just having to attach the other stuff. That'd be the pain. I also hate all the add-on to the pocket cinema camera. It's not run and gun. It's cinema camera, but more YouTubers are using it. They need to realize most stuff is for YouTube. Oh, absolutely, yeah. And if you're using it in a studio, which I know, I think that's what Gerald still does his stuff with is the uh, pocket cinema cameras in his studio. Like that makes sense. If you have direct power and it's kind of set and it's static, like what I have here, like, yeah, for sure, um, for do it. But I think the value of a pocket cinema camera and why I think if Blackmagic plays their cards right now that they have the Ursa 12K, great. Figure out, refine the pocket line. Like, give it a better name because it's not going in your pocket. Give it a, a, a little upgrade, facelift for battery. Stabilization internally would be great. Flip screen, autofocus. Like, they know what they have to do. It's just, will they do it and then release a product that's still at that same Blackmagic price point? Because that's the best part about the Blackmagic stuff is that it's a no-brainer because for what you get, it is so cheap relative. It's not cheap for, you know, it's still a 1000 or $2,000, so it's not nothing, but that's also incredible value compared to pretty much everything else. Even the Z-Cam that's, like, affordable doesn't have a screen built into it, and the uh, Pocket Cinema camera does. Let's see, Tilta makes a flip up screen, but it won't flip when vlogging? What? It won't flip when vlogging. I'm late, what's the topic? We're talking about really nothing. We're just chatting now. We've talked about all the topics I had lined up for the, for the night, and now we're just chatting away, talking about uh, pocket cinema cameras and, and ProRes versus B-RAW. These names, B-RAW, that doesn't really roll off the tongue all that well. Thought I'm in the list for R5 at B&H and waiting for a better firmware update. And then 12 to 1 is smaller than any ProRes format, but I wouldn't recommend 12 to 1 for a paid gig. Why wouldn't you recommend it for a paid gig, Steve? Yes, for paid gig, you want to do at least 5 to 1 compression, and the menu system on the pocket cinema camera is dumb proof, just easy. I've said this a mil million times. Can't be said enough. Blackmagic knows what they're doing with software. They have designed the best camera menu system, hands down. Sony revitalized, apparently, their menu system for the A7S III. It's nothing compared to what Blackmagic, their menus. They're the best. I've used RED cameras in the past with their menus, and they're clunky. They're slow and sluggish. I can't speak to their new stuff. Maybe the Komodo or some of the newer RED cameras are better. But, like, RED did the touchscreen, but it was just, like, just laggy, chuggy. The... Blackmagic, screens, and the menu, hands down the best. If Panasonic had good autofocus, I would pull the trigger. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's their, that's their Achilles heel. They they got to figure it out, but the, S, the S5 we were looking at still is doing DFD. Uh, there's got to be some good, clever what DFD really stands for. Dumb, effing, I don't know, <laughs> focus. Uh, I don't know. There's got to be something clever there. Someone funnier than me should come up with something. Reading, reading, reading. If Panasonic, good, yep, image doesn't 
auto flip with the tilt of screen. Oh, the camera doesn't recognize. I see the, the yeah. So you can flip the screen, but the image doesn't flip. Mm, yeah, no thanks. Like Blackmagic should just a new camera. When did the Pocket Cinema camera even come out? Is it a couple years old now? Let's see. Um, Blackmagic Pocket Cinema 4K original release. Sometimes when you Google this stuff, it doesn't actually come up. Hey, hey look at that. A cinema camera. Okay, but that was 2012. That's for the cinema camera. That's not the Pocket Cinema camera. Just the cinema camera. Yeah, the cinema camera was even insane. And that's like so far in the rear view mirror. Uh, let's see. Oh, Caleb did a Pocket 4K uh, 2019. It's got to be older than that. The original Pocket. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't care about that. See, that's what's... Uh, it's always hard to find when these things first shipped. Because like Amazon doesn't show that usually. Like the original release date does B&H. Uh, pocket Cinema 4K. Let's do that one. Because then the 6K was kind of like a, a nice little afterthought there. A little upgrade for the people who want the bigger sensor. Oh, this is interesting. The exact same price as a GH5 right now. Uh, is there an original release date on here? Mm, I have seen... Who does that? Uh, DP Review does that if they have the camera listed. But sometimes they don't have more of the cinema cameras. They only have like the, the photography ones, yeah. Maybe someone in the chat knows when the, well, like how, how do, how, how, how do, how do they, how, how do is a Panasonic, uh, a Blackmagic pocket cinema camera? Like it should be due soon, I would imagine an upgrade. Let's see. Uh, Black Magic Canon and Sony new cameras are good, but my GH5S has been shooting 10-bit for the last three years, so all these new cameras seem meh. The S5 looks cool. I'll be good with the GH6. Absolutely. If the, if you re-watch this stream, if you haven't been here the whole time, the beginning is me just talking about how awesome the GH5 is because it's been doing all this stuff for three years, like putting in work, getting the job done, not like just playing catch-up like all this other stuff is. It came out September 3rd, 2018. Thank you for the official date there. So we're basically two years out from the from the 4K. Okay, maybe, yeah. Yeah, it seems about, sure, seems about right. If they're releasing an Ursa Mini 12K, and the G2 doesn't seem like it was all that long ago. So I think it's it's time. They gotta have a new a new pocket version, something. Call it something other than pocket but a new upgrade of that. Lumix already had the technology for unlimited 6K. If they add that, they will cut into the market. The GH series focus more on in-camera video features, but it's not as popular as the other brands. Yep, and indeed, in September 2018, yes, confirmation on that for the original Pocket Cinema Camera 4K. The lack of B-RAW is one reason why the S1H isn't as attractive as it could be. I have a Z6 with a Ninja 5 with ProRes RAW, and it doesn't have the latitude, at least that's what my results have been. Well, thanks for sharing, Steve. Yeah. The S1H. Well, the Z6. I'd be curious. Have you tested? Have you tested the S1H or do you have it, Steve? I don't remember if you've mentioned it before. But I theoretically, I don't know if ProRes RAW is the is the latitude limitation there or if it's the Z6. I don't I don't actually know uh, one way or the other. But it'd be interesting to test that maybe you theoretically could get more latitude out of the S1H with ProRes RAW. But again, if you that's like external monitor and everything, do if you can do it all in the camera, that's like the solid foundation. And then the external should be for when you want to externally monitor and record a backup or do something like that. I don't think you should have to rely on you know the the signal being sent to this other recording device. I really like when it can do the features you want internally, or save some special mode. Like when the GH5, it was like okay, the HDMI will do, you know, the 10 bit for 4K 60. It's like, okay, I understand. Then like eight bits internal, fine, fine, that's fine. But for some of these other things, like you can only get raw when it's external. That's that's the big bummer. In Sweden, the price of the GH5 has gradually gone down in price, but the GH5S has never been reduced. I wonder why, interesting. I thought the 5S here in uh, the States, the 5S is, is cheaper than when it first came out. If I recall, the GH5S was 2,500 here in the States when it first came out. Now it's down to like 
1800 or 1600 kind of around the original price of the GH5 when it first came out. And now that's down to, you know, 1300 and lower. Would you say I let go of my wait list for the R5 and wait for an RF cinema camera since I have most RF glass? I am a torn man. I want to shoot things now, just torn. Um, that's, that's the tough thing. It's like if waiting for cameras sucks, if you need them now, if you just want them now, wait. If you need them now, buy what you can use right now. Uh, RF lenses, uh, that's a, that's an investment I have not made and I don't think I will make anytime soon. And RF glass, I'd probably stick with like EF for a while, maybe a couple native lenses for the camera I have, but I don't know. We'll see. I know the RF cinema line from Canon will come eventually. How soon? I don't know. What is it supposed to be? It's like a C200 type camera that they're, that they're mentioning. We'll see. I just, I, I think the Canon stuff is usually almost always overpriced for what you end up getting out of it. And people love Canon and they have the glass native and all that stuff. But I think there's a lot of other people who, you know, just are more budget conscious and they want to get more bang for their buck. And so they go elsewhere uh, to Blackmagic or to Sony, maybe Z cam. I don't know. GH6 needs better. Uh, needs autofocus better than the G9, the 4K 120 all internal. And it would be a winner for me. Yeah, absolutely. Those would be great features. B-Raw license would be nice for sure. I do not have an S1H. It is possible, but it may be the same bit rate when recording to the Ninja 5. For sure. I, I enjoyed using the S1H. Um, it, is a, it is an upgrade from the GH5 for sure, but I don't know. Needs needs a little price drop right now or just test it out as a rental. Autofocus is really overrated. It's really a new kind of concept. Yeah, but I think it's becoming more and more of a necessity for certain types of, of shooters in the same way that there are still photographers who do manual focus, but they also rely on autofocus in certain situations. I think you have to have both both features, and for a while, autofocus in, in video was just like, that wasn't a thing, no one was doing it. But now that it's kind of being more refined and polished, people are finding ways to take advantage of it the same way they've been taking advantage for it in photography and getting more out of it. So even though it's new, it is becoming a very quickly desirable feature for the people who are, who need that kind of functionality for a new way of shooting where it is totally just, you know, one man band style shooting and it's just you by yourself and you still want to get the thing in focus and it's on a gimbal, let's say one scenario. RF is too new. S1H is great. Just the slow rollout of Elmont glass crippled it a little. And that's always the state with new, new mounts, new systems. It's always the glass is always the limitation. And Sony's been doing it for a long time. Canon has all their EF glass that they're basically just, you know, making RF versions of. So, you know, full frame for Panasonic, at least, is that's a new thing. And not for, I don't know how new, I mean, L-mount is relatively, what was Leica doing before? Have they always had the L-mount? I don't know much about the history of Leica and and those cameras because they're just so freaking expensive. Autofocus is awesome. Try uh, Sony. When I had the GH5S with the Speed Booster XL and the Atomos alongside an A7 III, both with the 24 to 70, 28, both at 6400 ISO and 2.8, the GH5S kicked the crap out of the Sony People get mad about this. I, I'm sure. Like people say great things about the GH5S. Um, so for sure, it's a beautiful, beautiful camera. I prefer to opt for the regular. I had the GH5, you know, and didn't see the reason to go to the S. I'm sure it'd be better, but I like the internal stabilization. So having that ripped out and then paying more, you're, yeah, you're probably getting better image, but you're also losing a valuable feature. If they had been able to keep it, I, I think it would have been a, a a little bit more obvious for some of those people because I think far fewer people bought the GH5S than bought the GH5. Probably why the GH5S hasn't dropped for sure. I should say affordable L-mount glass. That's true, but Sigma's doing more L-mount glass stuff and they're always kind of that like sweet spot of, it's not, you know, a bargain, bargain basement, basement bargain, I don't know what the phrase is, garage sale pricing. Uh, it's not the cheap, cheap stuff, but Sigma always is, you know, competitive for the image quality. I mean, the Sigma 18 to 35 is a beautiful lens. Granted, it's not full frame, but uh, I love the Sigma glass. I think it's, uh, I think they make excellent products. So 
I'll kind of wrap things up there. I've been going streaming for, for plenty of time. Although I do appreciate all the back and forth in the chat. Uh, and yeah, I think I'll test out uh, B-Raw. I don't... When when did they implement all the different compression ratios for B-Raw? Which firmware update was that? Because I feel like it definitely wasn't something there to begin with. And I'm glad Blackmagic is still pushing things and making it better and making the stuff more widely available. Um, but I've just gotten so comfortable shooting ProRes. But maybe that's, maybe that's the problem. Like you got to push yourself sometimes and try things. Stay in the know about everything all the time, which is the hardest thing to do. Uh, but sometimes you just develop a workflow and you're like, oh, yeah, ProRes, it works. And honestly, on the Ursa Mini, like ProRes does work great. But now if we're talking about B-Raw and it's better and you get more dynamic range and it's easier to edit and, oh, excellent. No one answered, though, why you shouldn't use 12 to 1 on a client project if it looks the same as 3 to 1. So it must not look the same if it if you don't use it on client work. So there must be some sacrifice you're making there, but it's okay. A lot of stuff I shoot is ProRes Proxy even or ProRes Lite. It just depends on the resolution and the project. So don't get me wrong. I'm totally fine to shoot, you know, 12 to one compression if the project calls for it. I actually want the GH5S because it would enable me to get wobble free corners when using my seven to 14 for sure. I mean, do you t turn off the stabilization though, right? On the, or does it like not, I, I have the same seven to 14 lens. It's in the bag over there. I've never noticed wobbly corners, but I also don't use that lens in very wobbly situations. So I've never encountered that, that problem. Oh, I'm not sure. By the time I got my pocket 4K, it was six months after its release. It already had the compression options. Five to one is fine enough. I'd recommend three to one only at super low light. Oh, sure, sure. Well, I should do some testing and play around with it if it's on the... Uh... Let's look, let's look. Or so many Pro G2. Want to make sure we can do all these cool compression ratios. I think one time I did a shoot red and like red offered some insane. I mean, it was awful. It was abysmal, but it was like 28 to one compression raw or something at that point. It's like, why are you shooting raw? If it's like, uh, I don't know, raw 12 bit. So they've got 422 HQ, but where's, so they don't show the compression on here, the ratios. They might not, it might just be a B and H thing. I don't know, I'll have to play around with it. It's right here and I would do it right now, but I have to get a battery, I have to get a card. I have to do all that stuff. And I've already been streaming for a long time. That's a whole nother rabbit hole I'm sure we could go down. So let's do that another night. We'll wrap it up here. Let's see, 12 to one just can't be pushed as far and falls apart quicker. You just gotta nail exposure. Sure, well that's fine. I always nail my exposure. I mean, not always, not always. I try my best, but yeah, yeah, I get exposure right. I probably would even get white balance right. Like I try, you get everything right in camera no matter what. I think that's just a good practice in general. Just because you can shoot raw and you have all this flexibility doesn't mean you should just willy-nilly do it uh, all over the place. 12 to 1 looks better than any 8-bit I've seen, 8-bit camera that is, for sure. Um, I'll test it out, and we'll see. We'll play around with it, have some fun, see what the uh, pros and cons are there. We made a GH4S right before the GH5, but it never got released, so we made a 5S with a Sony sensor so the price won't drop till the 6 comes out. So, Callus, do you really work for Panasonic? You say these these comments like you work at Panasonic, and I'll believe you. I'll take your word for it. But I, they just let you tell you tell people about the GH4S in the live chat. I've never heard of a GH4S. Thanks for this. I'm stoked for the GH6. Yeah, me too. I'm stoked for the GH6, and I'm hoping they don't do the whole all the different SKUs, the GH6S or the GH6X or the GH6V. It just makes it harder to track like which one you want. If they are meaningful distinctions, I guess I'm probably okay with it. We'll see. But I don't know. I shoot B-Raw at weddings. I need that latitude. <laughs> it gets pretty crazy. I'm sure. Yeah, there's plenty of situations where you need where you need it. 
Bruh. GH6 is like the A7S III unicorn. Hush, hush. <laughs> well, GH6 would be its time. We know it's time. The GH5 has been out for over three and a half years. It's past the typical refresh cycle of the GH line. So we know it's time. And theoretically, could it have been announced at NAB? Theoretically, that'd be a good place to announce it or Photokina or something like that. But all that got shut down this year. So I understand the delay. However, I know there's many people like myself, maybe not many, I don't know how many of the number actually is, but like I'm very tempted by the A7S III. So a GH6 announcement, rumors, speculation, a leaked spec sheet would, I think, get people very excited for a potential of like holding out for a GH6. So I don't need a camera right now, but I'm at that point where, you know, the GH5 is feeling like, okay, it's getting kind of past its prime. It's still good, it's still usable but there's a few extra features I'd love to have that are a little bit more you know, reliable, like the autofocus, as we've been talking about, or higher frame rates, maybe slightly more resolution like you get with the S1H and you can do 6K. Very, very helpful in certain situations. So I see something like a GH6 and they say, oh, the GH6 has 6K and it does this other stuff that you, know, that you want. Maybe that's why it keeps people you know, with Micro Four Third or the GH line, whatever it ends up being rather than going to, to Sony. Cause you know, I'm looking at the A7S III going, whoo, that's a nice looking camera and does pretty much everything I would want aside from a few little bells and whistles, but I don't know. We'll see. Yeah, it is the unicorn. We'll see. We'll see how it goes. Thanks everyone for hanging out and I'll talk to you next time. Unless there's anything else in the chat. Nope. Doesn't look like it. See you later.